Welcome to our W.E. Obishan At Home podcast series with John Haley. I'm joined this morning by Dennis Luco, our paint specialist from our Webster, Massachusetts location. Dennis, welcome to At Home, sponsored by Obishan Hardware. Great to be here, John. Good to see you again. It's great to see you too, Dennis. We want to talk to our listeners today about trends in particular with wallpaper. We know that wallpaper is making a move back. Everything comes in a cycle. could be 10, 15, 20 years. But as we look through our brochures and marketing tools, we see that wallpapers are being slowly reintroduced. And I was hoping we could lean on your expertise to tell our audience a little bit about wallpaper, where it came from, a little bit of its history, and then we can discuss with our listeners application techniques, removal, and some other suggestions. So Dennis, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind giving us a little dissertation on wallpaper? Gladly. I've been in this business all my life, as John has said, and wallpaper has always been a big part of the decorating trade. For many years, uh, we sold out of stock. We sold it out of the books. Uh, Many years ago in the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s, it was called wallpaper simply because it was paper that you put on your wall. And I say that because then as time went on, they started improving the product by making vinyls or vinyl coated, many different styles and types of wall covering as far as the substrate goes. Many years ago, wallpaper, paper paper, as I call it, was the easiest thing to use. You could buy it in almost any pattern, but most people like to tweed and most of the time in a pastel color, a beige, a gray, a pink. That's what was in the house I grew up in. And uh, those houses that that was used in, it was easier because they had what they had, horsehair plaster on the walls. And what they used to do is you would mix up what they called a glue wall size, and that would fill in all those pores in the horsehair plaster. And then you would mix up a powdered wheat paste that you would actually apply to the paper, paste it up, and put it on the wall. It wasn't as easy as just putting it on the wall. You had some starting points to do. Um, Also, besides the horsehair plaster, the houses that were being built in the 60s and so on then used a much better grade plaster. Uh, That's when you saw it more common. So the wallpaper's got to be a little bit better. I know even back when we had the paper paper, if somebody wanted a uh, something in their kitchen that wouldn't stain, we had a product that they called resistane, and it was it looked very much like what today's uh, acrylic polyurethanes look like. They're almost white, milky in the can, and when you sprayed it, when you brushed it on, it would dry crystal clear, and it would give you a coating that made the paper durable and a little bit washable. And because of that trend some manufacturers started making what they call vinyls. Now, as I remember, the first vinyls that came out were what they called a solid sheet strippable vinyl. The company was Sanitas, and the product was called Waltex. And that name was used just like when someone uses, wants a tissue, no matter what name is on it, they call it a Kleenex. And that's what Waltex was. People would come in, do you have Waltex wall covering? And we always said, yes. And we also have Waltex type wall coverings. And that was really the best. And it was the beginning of an era with the strippable type wall coverings. They were almost double the money. I think you paid all of $2.99 a single roll for the paper paper. And then you went into this vinyl and it might have been $7.99 a single roll. But it sold very well, particularly in kitchens and in bathrooms. What I do remember also is the application at that time was starting to change. You had a vinyl paste because it would dry faster because you didn't get the air for it to dry the way you could with the paper paper. So you needed a special adhesive. You had a special wall size too. Again, we were still pretty much into the powdered type products at that time. And then came along in that era is something that was called pre-pasted wallpaper. What was happening in the late 60s was a lot more of the homeowners were becoming what we call do-it-yourselves. We didn't have HGTV and all that then. People would come into the stores and they would ask how to do this. And we used to explain to them the importance of a wall size because it would allow you to slide the wallpaper as you were hanging it so you could butt it at the seams. 
And it would also make it easier in the end so that you could strip it off the wall because sometimes you could take the wall with you if it wasn't prepared properly. And then people wanted other vinyls because these were starting to become, well, I won't say cost prohibitive, but they were going up greatly in price. But people still wanted that durability of a vinyl. And what they started to make then is some of these vinyl coated coverings and they did it in a number of different ways. Some it was just a coating that would work similar to what that resisting I talked about earlier was. And we saw this coming in into the 70s. Again, a lot of it came through pre-pasted. I think by the time most of the books were out going, they all were pre-pasted. Difference in that is, is the homeowner liked the pre-pasted because they didn't have to mix the paste and put it on. We used to put, have this cardboard box we called the water tray or water trough almost looked like a planter and you'd cut your roll and you'd put it in there you'd let it soak for a couple of minutes and then you would slowly pull it out and this is still available today um, and then we would mention that you would bookend your material so that the paste could soak in for a couple of minutes and it would help alleviate a lot of bubbles what happened in time is again the the products were becoming a lot more improved they came up with some what they called the ready-made pastes, and there were different products for that too. And then you came up with some better wall sizes that were liquid and you just painted on the wall. And we sell Shields now, which is a product from Zinzer, um, and that would bond the paper onto the wall again, most importantly, allowing that slideability. And in cutting wallpaper, you always need a sharp razor blade, sometimes a blade every time you're going to cut. And a good cutting tool, I like that 23-inch guide that uh, Hyde sells. We sell it in our stores, and that just allows you to just cut it right up along the, the top and the bottom very easily. When starting some of these projects, too, a lot of people, I know myself, I've been guilty of it, is sometimes I just start in the corner and I and I go along but they did actually have what they called a plumb bob years ago, and you would tack it up to the top of the wall. It was a piece of chalk you ran down, and you snapped it, and it would give you a straight line to start. And what you weren't supposed to start in the corner. You were supposed to start next one over, and uh, you would end up at the end without having to do an overlap because one of the important things in all the vinyls is sometimes people would overlap, and they wouldn't put enough glue on it, and then all of these would break open. You'd see the seams breaking, breaking open. Um, and a lot of the papers years ago were made in the States. And when they were made in the States, they were 72 square feet per double roll, 36 in a single roll. And we would cut a single roll if someone just needed nine single rolls of paper. Um, you would, uh, and that's basically, as it says, the square footage, the 72 square feet. And your average 9 by 12 room back then probably would use 8 to 10 rolls. Depending on the pattern. The pattern may dictate if you needed more or less in the roll count. Am I correct in that? It could if you had one of those real real big patterns, yes, because you have, you wanted to make sure you got it even. Um, but in your usual 20 and a half inch rolls, that would be the case, as, as I had just said. But they did start making some bigger patents, and they did make some wider rolls. That I know they went up to 27-inch rolls for, let's say, homeowner uh, residential properties. Um, I also, at one time, was a commercial rep for a company called General Wall Covering, and that was the 54-inch goods materials, which is something else all in itself. That's what I'm familiar with. Yes. Binding up the I old know. brownstones in South Boston. That's correct, yes. And uh, I probably sold some of it to you back in the 90s or whenever I did that. But um, uh, that was a very interesting business, too. Uh, 54-inch goods were used in your hotels, your hospitals, nursing homes, all of your office buildings. Uh, Some restaurants used it too. Um, The beauty of it was it was very, very heavy. It was, like I say, 54 inch. You base that on yardage, not on square feet. It was done on square yards. And uh, sometimes even putting the paste on, you had a heavy duty paste for it. The adhesives have changed too because they had a clay-based paste they used to use many years ago. I'm sure that's what you work with most of the time. 
And, and we'll be talking <laughs> about that in a few moments. <laughs> Some even had a pasting machine to put it on with rather than roll it on. Uh, and that, a lot of times, you those were all very heavily textured goods, too. You could still have a patent in it, but a lot of times it was just kind of something plain. Um, and another thing in, in that, uh, when I was working for GenCorp, is we could special make wall covering. I remember we did something for one of the courthouses down in Boston that was a special print that had to be put behind the judge's desk. Um, but you could choose your own, and they were able to make that then, and that's how far along that had come at that time. Quite a history to the wallpaper, where it began, where we are today, the technology and the adhesives, the sizing material, actually the components made in the paper and how they're manufactured today with their dyes and inks. You've hit many subjects here in your discussion about wallpapers, Dennis, that I'd like to maybe step back just for our listening sure. audience to really know how important these steps are if they want to take on a wallpapering project of their own. I'm so glad you started off with the discussion on sizing. So sizing, I did like the fact that we're leveling the surface off. We're getting a more uniform surface for the papers to adhere to, but we're also allowing that paper to be released in the back end. When I got into the wallpaper business and I was removing papers, there was a lot of folks way back when that chose not to use size, and they used a clay paste. So this gets into our upcoming conversation about how do we remove papers and the different tasks involved there. Mm -hmm. But the sizing in modern-day technology... It's essential because we're in a changing world regularly. We change colors every four or five years. We change design. There's trends that come and go. So why would somebody want to hang paper to have an arduous task to remove it? Right. So we want to encourage to our listening audience, if you want to take on a wallpapering job, take the moment to talk to one of your paint specialists at Obershawn Hardware about the importance of sizing your walls. And in the long run, you'll be the benefactor of having a better surface to put your wallpaper and your investment up on. You also mentioned in the process of laying paper a very important technique called booking. And when you discussed putting paper onto the wall, and sometimes we didn't allocate enough time or space, we could have a separation in our seams. So the booking is essential. It allows the paper to absorb the moisture, expand, and then contract. So if we put paper up and we didn't let it sit long enough booking, and we put it up wet and it hasn't had a chance to contract back to its normal state, we could put the paper up and naturally on its own, it would open up. So the booking concept is really a matter of putting it and then walking away from it for a few moments. Am I correct, Dennis? That is correct. And like I said, if you don't do that and you try to put it up when it's still wet, sometimes you get a lot of air bubbles underneath it and they're hard to smooth out. They may dry out in time, but it isn't worth the the time you're going to waste in doing that is better that you do the booking and wait that couple of minutes. There would be no reason for us to aggressively have to use plastic or blades of any kind to try and push air pockets off the paper if we just allow the pace to set up and do their thing. Then we can open up the paper with your plumb bob. Modern day, somebody may use a level and still create your line one way or the other. But as long as we are preparing ourselves with the right environment, allowing the size to cure on the wall, allowing the booking process to take place. Also, what's very, very important that you mentioned is making sure we have enough paper for the space. Now, we know between the various sizes of goods, anywhere from 27 to 55-inch goods, there's a certain amount of square footage these papers will cover. But some of those patterns we talked about, if it was an old rosette or flowery pattern mm -hmm. we have an 18 inch or 24 inch run in order to catch a pattern so those six or seven rolls we may have gotten maybe a roll or two short and that leads into the discussion about really evaluating the square footage of the surface we want to cover looking at the pattern repeat that's inside the pattern itself the width of that paper to ensure we have enough paper for the project if not dennis What's the word runs mean when they're manufacturing wallpaper? That's a very important thing with wallpaper is the run. You can buy 16 rolls of run one and be a double roll short. You order a double roll and it comes in and it's run 16. You're going to see a color difference most times. And I've seen that. And it's uh, very important. Uh, like you say, you could have an 18 inch repeat on the patent and you really have to calculate that into what you're going to get. And what I used to do a lot of times, and people would do it, is if we were on that borderline of, say, 16 to 18 single rolls, I would encourage them to buy the 18 rolls. And we could always take a double roll back. But 
Uh, and most would do that because they just didn't want to take the chance of not getting that right run. As a distributor of wallpaper in your previous history, Dennis, over-ordering in a wallpaper situation is not a harmful situation. Correct. Most wallpaper suppliers will take back the unused goods. So this way you ensure you have enough product for your project. Most important. The only other thing I've said to people, if they feel they're not going to do it, I tell them when you get to your third corner before you go to your final wall, make sure you have enough. If you don't, then order two rolls or whatever, two double rolls or whatever you need to finish. Then at least if you have that different run all on one wall, it's kind of like when you, when someone's painting and you tell them if you're not going to have enough, stop in the corner, don't stretch it out to the middle of the wall. This is other great advice that all of our consumers can expect to get from each and every one of our paint specialists throughout the Obershawn Hardware stores. Now, Dennis, we've talked about the various histories of paper, where they came from, how they developed. We've talked about some of the key important items to pay attention to, from sizing to the booking properly to making sure you have enough paper. But now let's take a step back. Say we're entering a room that we want to re-wallpaper. So now we have to start off with mo the most arduous task of removing an existing paper. We could run into a lot of different situations there, Dennis. So why don't you take a moment and tell us some of the things that we should anticipate or think about when we want to remove wallpaper from an existing wall. One thing with what I talked about before and having the solid sheet or strippable vinyl, that was the very, very best. You can test if you have that by just taking a corner and pulling it. And if you can keep pulling it and nothing peels off in your hand and stays partly on the wall, you can strip that right off of the wall. That you don't see as much as what happened in the 90s for the most part in 2000 with the wall covering industry. It switched from being made in America to being made in Europe, and we went to metric rolls instead of the, the uh, square foot rolls as we had before. But besides that, they wanted something that was going to be durable, and what they did a lot of times is they made it what they called a peelable vinyl. These are very, it's not a hard job to do, but it is a lot of work. The peelable vinyl would allow you to peel the wallpaper off of a paper backing. That paper backing, if put on properly with the wall size and so on, it can still be a little bit cumbersome. We recommend that you use a scoring tool. They call it Paper Tiger from Zinza Company. And you can just keep running that over the paper. And what that does is it puts these tiny holes in it so that when you put a wallpaper remover on it, it'll allow it to penetrate in behind the paper so that you can remove it. And what I tell people is if you want to strip off all the peelable part in one day, that's fine. What I generally tell when they start this process of scoring and putting on the wallpaper remover if you're doing it alone, score as much as you want. But when you put the wallpaper remover on, I generally recommend that you only go about three feet. Wallpaper remover, a lot of times it's a concentrate. You, we sell diff in a gallon or in a quart, and the quart will make a couple gallons of wallpaper remover, which is about what it'll take. You mix it in with lukewarm water, and you apply it. I like using one of those bug sprays like you use when you clean your deck. That really gets it on good. I always recommend, even before the days of us having to wear a mask every day, you put one of those masks on too, because that stuff has something in it that can get to you uh, and make you cough, sneeze, or whatever. So I always recommend wearing that mask too, because you're going to get some backsplash of that product. In, but you just put it on for a few feet, because if you did the whole room with that, it would dry up before you could use it, and it would lose its capacity to work. One of the things we like to recommend, even with paints and primers, just in general, when we have to rely on chemicals to do some of the work, we have to let the chemicals do the, do work. the work. So if we just misted the wall with that backing of the paper you just mentioned and we wheelie bird it, are we going to put that bug sprayer right down and pick up a knife? Or do we pause for a few moments, let it activate, let that paper become saturated to make your removal a little less right. arduous. And, and that's why I say you just do that three or four feet. You let it soak up. And you can tell if it takes 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or even a half an hour to start scraping that off. And then you can judge how much you can go. You can go three feet, four feet, or whatever the next time. And you'll know the intervals at which you continue to spray it on. So this is just another example of testing. 
testing the chemicals for the strength that we need and testing its activation and really how much we can do at a certain time. So just like working with outside strippers, we want to test. We want to test right now if we're going to go through this process because we're adding moisture into our space. More than likely, we're going to have to protect our floors or our baseboard. So we're cognizant of all this. And if we're spraying that, we have a ceiling that may get misted as well. So stripping wallpaper means we want to be mentally prepared for a task. That means having our floors protected, making sure we have the right bug sprayer you just mentioned so we can put on the stripping material uniformly, making sure we have the proper knife. It could be simply a hide six-inch blade. It doesn't necessarily have to be a razor blade. We've seen the razor blades used over the lifetime, haven't you, Dennis, where they gouge the wall? That's right. So we recommend maybe some a little softer effort, maybe that a flexible blade. And just like with plastering and joint compound, instead of going at something straight on a straight line, sometimes coming up at a slight arch. When you're taking paper off, move your blade in a slight right left turn or the left turn, and that way you're not just going directly onto a flat surface. If a surface was plastered, it's not perfect in the first place. So we can temper our application and removal process through testing. So we strongly encourage that. And the other part before we go on is we mentioned a plaster wall, and most of the time it is this has been put on a plastered wall, but there are some houses that only had sheetrock. I know that was my parents' house, and uh, my mother wound up paneling, which I wasn't happy about. <laughs> but with sheetrock, you have to be even more careful. You can't have that soaking in water for too long like you can with plaster. So again, it's the test if you have sheetrock to see how long. You may even want to go shorter intervals in in between because you don't want that bubbling uh, the paper on top of the sheetrock to start coming off with the wallpaper. So here's a perfect example. Do we end up uh, encouraging our customers, if they're looking at taking this new drywalled space and they want to hang paper, do we want to rely just strictly on size, or could we recommend putting a coat of 046, a latex primer on there Absolutely. to protect that, that mud that's porous and the paper that's soft? That's correct. So we'd still encourage putting a size coat on top of the primer, wouldn't we? Absolutely. Not only on the removal part, as we mentioned before, but another thing that a wall size does is when you're hanging the paper, you have to slide it. You want to get those, those seams right together perfectly. And a wall size allows you to do that. If you only primed it with the 046, that's a flat surface. It doesn't give you any room to move at all. And you really want the the wall covering to be able to move, to slide into place. Because we do not want to stretch the paper. Because if you stretch the paper, what happens when it dries? It opens up the seams, and it's very hard to get that back together again. All right, so this is great information we've been able to discuss already to this point, just about the papers, how they're manufactured, preparing ourselves to have an application that's going to perform for us through booking, through sizing, and getting the proper runs and the proper quantity of material. We've talked about using the wheelie bird in order to remove the paper itself. Now, Dennis, you did mention two different adhesives that were used in yesteryear's wallpaper application, wheat and clay. So we both know that the clay paste is a bear to remove. But in brief, we want to get that surface down as smooth as possible to the existing plaster. That clay paste, if we try to put primer on it or a latex primer or just the paper itself, we're going to reactivate the paste. It ends up becoming a bubbly mess. So it is encouraged, we are encouraging our customers to use an alkyd primer to seal in that plaster and the adhesives from that previous application. Do you concur with that? Absolutely. The big thing, too, is is run your hand over the wall and, and, and make sure that you sand it properly. Do the best you can. Sometimes it's gummy and you can't get it all off at once, but go back and sand it. A lot of times, I'm not crazy about it, but if you're just going to paint the wall and not hang wallpaper over it again, after the alkyd primer, just look at it, and if you see any high spots that almost looks like a textured wall, then just hit them with some sandpaper and then reprime that area. Well, that wouldn't be the first time I've had to take out the trowels and knives, taking paper off the wall, whether it had clay paste up there. And unfortunately, it's just an arduous task to try and remove that material from the surface. But Dennis, the point you made about sanding to get to a smooth surface, everything that's on that surface will be represented through a new paper or a paint coating. 
So Dennis, today we had an opportunity to give our listening audience a great history on wallpaper, how it started with the original papers and how it developed into vinyl coating papers and the various applications for both residential and commercial goods. We've had a chance to describe to our customers the importance of sizing the walls, booking their materials, and most importantly, ordering enough wallpaper to complete the task. We've had a chance to review some of the arduous work of cleaning up after a, a wallpaper removal. We've taken the time to discuss how to remove the papers properly. So we've given our audience a lot of information today on a trending application. Is there anything else you'd like to add to our discussion on wallpaper today, Dennis? Another thing that we didn't mention too much is there was is a wallpaper border. Those were very common too. Uh, I remember way back when I talked about those tweed wallpapers and so on on the horsehair plasters, you could buy a little one inch border and it would finish it off nicely if you didn't have a crown molding in your house. A lot of the newer houses, people did wind up with a crown molding and borders started to be eliminated. They were very nice in their day when you got the right one, but there was a time when people were, they didn't want to go through the wallpapering but they would paint their walls and then they would put a border on top of that or a border on a wall covering. For that, you used what they called a border adhesive, which was a little bit better. It was more like an Elmer's glue. Another thing, too, is sometimes with wallpaper after time, it can be up for 10 or 15 years and still look good, but sometimes the seams will start to lift a little bit, and there is a product, uh, an adhesive in a tube, and uh, you put that on these seams, and if you do that right, uh, the seams will go back into place and stay. You have a chance to restore time. your paper. Yes, and, and it's just in a tube, and you, I generally recommend you put it on, and you let it set up, though, for five or ten minutes. Let that product get sticky because it goes on very watery. And then it's best if you have a seam roller. A lot of people don't have those these days, but those things were great for rolling the seams together and it would get the excess paste out that you could take a sponge to right away and then you wouldn't see any extra paste on the wall. You know, it's wonderful you mentioned the borders because it is a trend as well. So both the wallpaper, wallpaper borders, they've come and gone over the years. Some of your descriptions went back to the 40s and 50s. That's right. Here we are in 2021 and papers are finding their way back. Dennis, I want to thank you for sharing all of your expertise and your knowledge about the wallpaper industry. Our listeners appreciate the understanding of where wallpaper came from and some of the steps that we can go through to really achieve the ultimate results in hanging paper in our own home. Dennis, I want to thank you once again for being with us here at home today, sponsored by Obershawn Hardware. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our listening audience. For more information, please visit hardwarestore.com. Thanks for listening to At Home with John Haley.